Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to CIO Leadership Live. I'm Mary Fran Johnson. I'm the Executive Director of CIO Programs at IDG, and I have the great fortune today to be interviewing and speaking with Dick Daniels, who is the Executive Vice President and CIO of Kaiser Permanente. Dick reports directly to CEO Bernard Tyson, and he leads the IT vision strategy and execution across this $75 billion healthcare enterprise. Kaiser, based in California, is one of the largest integrated health systems in the United States, with 39 hospitals, more than 200,000 members, and 12.2 million members, and 200,000 employees. Prior to his current role, Dick was Kaiser's Senior Vice President of Enterprise Shared Services. He joined the company about a decade ago as the Business Information Officer for the Health Plan and Hospital Operations, and he brought with him more than 30 years of IT leadership experience from J.P. Morgan, Capital One, and the U.S. Air Force. I'm delighted to have you here today, Dick. Thank you. Well, it's, it's good to spend time with you, Mary Fran, and I'm happy that you invited me to participate. All right. Uh, we've had a lot of great conversations on the show, and I know from our long relationship, both uh, here at, from CIO Magazine, from all of the events we do back when even when I was with Computer World, that it's just always fun talking to you because you always have so much going on. Um, in fact, it was just a year ago when I saw you at our event in San Francisco, and you were our keynote speaker, and that time your topic was On Demand Everything, and it was about IT leadership in the age of the connected consumer. And it was, um, you talked about how today's digitally connect connected consumers are taking the lead in driving business transformation across the industry, but also very definitely in healthcare. So I wanted to start with a little bit about the changing customer demands, the industry disruption that's going on in healthcare. And I think you have something you talk about called the six forces of change. Yes, uh, and thank you for uh, asking about those because it's good that we start from a industry perspective. Mm -hmm. And I do want to talk about uh, six different items very quickly mm -hmm. that are changing in the healthcare industry. Good. And the first one I want to start with is, is about the demographic changes that are happening. So we, we live in a country where, frankly, the baby boomers are getting older. And consequently, we're going to see more demands mm -hmm. for health care. You know, it's really based upon people just getting older. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, while uh, the, we have an older population to take care of, the quantity of health care workers available is shrinking. Okay. So this presents some real challenges for the health care industry. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, there is a consumerization that's taking place of health care. Um, it's really interesting because uh, mm -hmm. what consumers expect from health care is largely being shaped by their experience with other industries. Mm -hmm. So the fact that people can grab their uh, smartphone and go into online banking and do any type of right. banking transactions, people have those same types of expectations when they come to health care. Mm -hmm. uh, thirdly, uh, healthcare is uh, a lot of innovations are taking place. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, we see a lot of new entrants uh, coming into healthcare, and a lot of non-traditional players. I'm sure you saw the announcement about uh, Amazon, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, and J.P. Morgan Chase. You wouldn't typically think of uh, companies like that getting into healthcare, mm -hmm. but we do see a lot of new interests and a lot of innovation taking place in healthcare. Yeah, well, who would have thought that Google would be affecting the thermostats in our homes? You know, I mean, exactly. a lot of these That's tech giants are changing the industry, the landscape for all industries, and I guess healthcare doesn't get a pass on that. Well, and uh, there is a lot of money in healthcare. <laughs> so yes. mm -hmm. that that tends to have it that tends to attract people <laughs> uh, to an industry. So you know there's just a lot of interest in healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, next is the expanding role of government. Ah. And I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier about the older population, the, how the population is aging. That means that there are going to be more people covered by both Medicare and Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And we. 
as more people are covered by Medicare and Medicaid, where the government really determines what the payments are going to be, that is forcing the industry to uh, get more efficient. Yeah. And uh, the last couple of things are just about the consolidation that are taking place because uh, we see more uh, payers or insurance companies combining with hospitals, combining with pro provider wow. groups. Mm -hmm. So I would say probably 20 years ago, we saw a lot of consolidation taking place in the financial services industry. Yep. Now we see a lot of consolidation starting to play, take place in health care. Mm -hmm. And the last uh, industry uh, item I'd like to mention is about affordability. Uh. I think by, you know, we all know that health care is just expensive. And it's uh, expensive to corporations who provide health care to their employees. Mm -hmm. It's expensive to individuals who are buying health care. And it's expensive for the government. Yeah. So I don't think anybody's happy about the cost. So I think mm -hmm. as a, it's an industry challenge to continue to make health care more affordable. Yeah. So those are some of the, the five or six forces that I think the industry is dealing with uh, with health care. Well, and of course, you mentioned one of them being government and the role and the regulations and all. But there's almost a shadow seventh one in just the sheer politics around health care today and all of the different voices on it, which thankfully for us both, we won't try to solve that on this call. <laughs> um, well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay away from politics. Oh, very yeah. Right. Oh, me too. Me too. Um, let's shift to something that's more fun to talk about, uh, the essentially the leading edge kind of digital activities that your members are not just waiting to see in a year or two, but things that Kaiser is doing right now, that your consumers, your members, those 12.2 million people um, are are noticing in their dealings with Kaiser. So within Kaiser Permanente, we are we absolutely have a strategy, mm -hmm. you know, to deal with this six, these six forces and the forces of change that we're seeing in the industry. But I'd like to tell you about something that we did within our organization, and it leads up to some fundamental beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, as we are seeing what's happening within the organization, the senior management of the organization really got together to talk about our strategy and how we wanted to respond to all the challenges. Yeah. And one of the things that we spent time on was coming up with uh, our fundamental beliefs about healthcare and what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. And the result of our uh, communication with each other was, I think, very powerful. And I'd like to just share with you what we came up with four fundamental beliefs that are driving our strategy. Okay. And I want to read these because I want to make sure I get them right. And the first one is, we believe that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness require total health. Mm -hmm. And that includes equal access to high-quality health care for all. Mm -hmm. Number two, we believe that total health is more than freedom from physical affliction. It's about mind, body, and spirit. Mm -hmm. Number three, we believe that health care must be affordable for all because thriving individuals, families, and communities require that. Mm -hmm. And number four, we believe in a healthy and engaged life with good beginnings and dignified endings. Mm. Okay. So, so these four beliefs are like the guideposts mm -hmm. for our strategy, and that it, that's what's driving us. Yeah. So there are certain there are certain things that have been born out of these beliefs, like uh, making healthcare more affordable. So we're committed to uh, an agenda of affordability within our organization. Uh, another one is this focus on uh, what we call mental health and awareness. Mm -hmm. So mental health and wellness. So we, when I talked about mind, body, and spirit, uh, one of the things that you'll see, and I don't know if anyone has really had a chance to look at it, we uh, launched a campaign called Find Your Words. And it's on findyourwords.org. Okay. And if you go to findyourwords.org, 
you will find uh, it, it will just be interesting to explore it. But this is where we're addressing uh, mental health and wellness. Okay. And in particular, de depression. So we want to make sure that we are um, we look at people's mental health, mm -hmm. not just their physical health. Yeah. We know, and it's we. One of the points you made when we talked recently, because we were talking about strategy, um, and you made the point that there's a big difference between an IT strategy, which is things you implement within the IT organization, and then what you're doing with technology across Kaiser Permanente, because that's not something you're just leaving to the different business unit leaders. That's you're in charge of all of that the way technology essentially is, is spooling out across the organization. Um, talk a little bit about that journey and some of the pieces of it. Uh, I know you've made some progress, and, you know, you can call out a few of those, but it's also interesting what you have in front of you. I mean, the notion of IT strategy, as, as you pointed out, is usually kind of narrow, but when technology strategy is a much bigger topic. Absolutely. So I, w I want to talk a little bit about both of those because okay. they are different. In looking at our overall use of technology in Kaiser Permanente, there are three big pillars mm -hmm. uh, to our overall strategy in the organization. The first one is really around optimizing our current capabilities okay. because we're a technology-enabled organization and there's still opportunities to optimize what we've already installed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, using technologies, whether we're talking about um, RPA or machine learning and artificial intelligence and chatbots. Mm -hmm. So we think there's a lot of opportunity uh, still to optimize our current capabilities. Yeah. The second big piece is around digital. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm going to talk later about digital, but... Uh, we think there are still opportunities to digitize, if you will, uh, many functions within our organization. And the third one, is, uh, I just put it under the area of innovation, but the way I like to talk about it is strategic innovation. So it's not innovation for innovation's sake. It's, it's directed towards something yeah. where we want to make a big change in our organization and do some transformational things. Now, within the IT organization, uh, there um, I'll talk about it very quickly, but there are five pillars to our <laughs> internal strategy. Dick, you've strategy. got more pillars and lists. I don't know how you keep track of it all. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a list person. Right? I know. So I know. I, I can have I have I can, to have frameworks. <laughs> I can see and, you going down. You know, it's it's like a whole forest of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, the. the Within the IT organization, we're modernizing our infrastructure, and yeah. this is really taking more advantage of cloud computing and the capabilities that mm -hmm. are there. The second one is we have to accelerate development. So we're looking at how do we leverage agile and DevOps. Right, and, and design thinking and all that, yeah. Exactly. Then uh, improving productivity. Mm -hmm. We need to improve the productivity of our IT organization, and we're looking at where are the where's the manual work taking place within IT and where are the places that we can automate it and have there with the productivity piece has that changed in what you're measuring because you know that's a a, a long standing complaint against IT organizations is they have a tendency to have a lot of metrics about things that only IT people care about, you know. Uh, well, everybody cares if the network's down, but network uptime statistics and that sort of thing. So when you think about, like, the way you're measuring uh, and watching your progress with IT productivity, uh, what are you measuring that means a lot to your business colleagues? Well, our approach is really internally looking at what things are still being done manually that we can automate. Okay. Okay. So, so that's what we're looking at is the manual work and seeing where we can introduce automation to reduce the amount of manual work. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of metrics, there, there are really two big things that the organization cares about from IT. One is the availability of systems every day and make sure that those systems are up and running and available. Right. And the second one is uh, the projects. Mm -hmm. The projects that we're executing on, are we getting those delivered on time and on budget? Mm -hmm. And uh, we're sort of changing the way we uh, measure that because as we are 
uh, employing different methodologies like DevOps or Agile, you know, you're not going to be late, right? So it's mm. a matter of throughput and velocity and the, those types of metrics. Yeah. And the, the last two pillars of my strategy are around reliability and security. So we talked about mm -hmm. um, availability. But cybersecurity is a very big deal. Yeah. And we want to make sure that that's prominent in our strategy because it's really imperative, mm -hmm. I think, for every organization to make sure they have a strong cybersecurity program and managing that risk to the organization. Yeah. What? And then lastly mm -hmm. is empower our people. Yeah. Because yeah. none of none of this happens without people. Right. So yes. it's really important that we are supporting our people. It's important that we're providing great training to our people mm -hmm. because these new technologies do require people to get retrained so that they're competent and they're prepared to exercise these new technologies yeah. to support the needs of the organization. Well, and that, that comment about the people, I think that whenever I talk with CIOs about cybersecurity issues, uh, the education and training, and the, I should say the constant education and training that is needed around cybersecurity uh, awareness and procedures and all that is usually tantamount to how successful it is. Um, tell, uh, tell me about... What is the size and scope of the IT organization that you have running all these pillars and, and providing all these services for those those 12.2 million members and the 200,000 or, or more employees? How large is your IT operation? We, we have about 6,000 employees in IT. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way that we have, uh, the way that we're organized is we have big, you know, big businesses within Kaiser Permanente, and we are organized and aligned to support our business partners. So mm -hmm. our model is, our org model is one that's aligned to uh, supporting our health plan, which is, you know, largely around insurance products. Mm -hmm. But also we have a big care delivery uh, yes. organization that we support. So we have people aligned to care delivery, and we have another group of people that's aligned to what we call our business functions like uh, HR, finance, legal. Okay. So th that's largely how we're organized, especially from a project delivery perspective. Okay. And we also have kind of the, the shared services portion of our organization, mm -hmm. which is about all the infrastructure, uh, data centers, networks, mm. you know, all the traditional infrastructure. And of course, we have our risk management organization because we have we work in a highly regulated environment. Yes. So having good strong controls in place where we're managing risk, managing cybersecurity is very important. Mm -hmm. And one of the changes that we made the last couple of years is we pull all of application support into a single organization. Oh, okay. So we have mm -hmm. all of application support together so that uh, we can leverage some of the processes and capabilities there. So that's that's largely how we're yeah. organized. Okay. And then we we utilize external companies from time to time when we're working on projects so we can manage the peaks and valleys. Yes. Well, and I wonder, too, with that staff of the, the IT force of about 6,000, are those all people that work for Kaiser, or are you including partners and augment, augmented staff in that? No, the, the 6,000 are all... Kaiser All Permanente Kaiser. employees. Yeah. Do you have, are you, where are you with cloud? Are you significantly into the cloud with a number? And I know we're going to talk more about digital in a while, but some organizations I talk with are on a journey to get X amount of percentage into the cloud uh, or into, you know, outsourced um outsourced approaches and then other organizations are insourcing more than they're outsourcing so where do you stand on that pendulum that's always swinging around in the industry well it's, it's swinging around in my organization as well uh-huh i was I, I would say that we are uh, on the journey with our use of cloud yeah but frankly what we started is we have we have implemented cloud technologies within our own data centers of course so we're yeah we're able to take advantage of many of the benefits that are afforded to us through cloud computing within our own data centers. Mm -hmm. However, uh, we, we're also taking advantage of some of the capabilities externally as well. 
So a good example is we moved uh, our organization from an internally hosted Lotus Notes environment to Microsoft Office 365 that is hosted by Microsoft. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, that was like 200,000 mailboxes that we migrated. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say that we're being opportunistic. If there are certain applications that we want to host externally, uh, we're doing that. But I, I don't have a big program where I want to move, get out of the data center business and go, you know, all the way to external clouds. I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. However, however, I absolutely want to get the advantages and the benefits of cloud computing. Yeah. And we're doing some of that internally and selectively external. Right. Well, and that, that kind of that loops back into those six forces of change that uh, we talked about right at the beginning. And one of them was the consolidation going on in the industry and new partners, new partners and perhaps new competitors or um, opportunities to acquire. Uh, some of these new companies that are popping up. So it just, I know it's a constantly shifting landscape out there. Um, one of the things I wanted to loop back to was about uh, kind of back to the members and to what they're seeing from Kaiser. Uh, I know mobile technology and eventually 5G network availability is going to really radically change the way everything is delivered. What's it going to do to healthcare? Where do you see, you know, I've had our, our mutual friend uh, Jim Rinaldi at uh, Jet Propulsion Lab is something that we've talked about this, you know, how how much the, that constant availability of the network is going to change the way services are delivered and conceived and all of that. Well, I think one of the big changes that we're going to see, and we haven't fully realized it here yet, this Internet of Things Okay. I mean, we hear it talked about a lot, but I, but I believe what's going to happen is more and more medical devices mm -hmm. are get, going to provide us the ability to remotely monitor patients. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the big challenges there will be that 5G will enable that because, you know, we'll have stronger networks that allow us to uh, do this monitoring. But the challenge is going to be how do we manage the data yes. uh, coming off of these devices. But this is one of those things where there's going to be a convergence where the device manufacturers are going to be manufacturing uh, medical equipment that allow us to monitor, do remote monitoring, and the networks are going to be strong enough that we can actually transport the data. Right. So there is some engineering that still needs to take place, but I think that's going to be one of the big changes that we see in healthcare. Okay. Okay. The um, when we were talking about the the business strategy, the beliefs that your business strategy is built around, you know, the total health access and uh, the mind body spirit connection. How do you communicate that to that IT organization? Those 6,000 people, they don't get a chance to sit down. They're not as lucky as me. They don't get a chance to sit down and talk with you one-on-one. -on -one. So what are your approaches as a CIO in making sure that everybody's kind of on that same strategic page about where where Kaiser is heading? Okay, I, I'm going to answer your question. <laughs> however, I, I, however, I will say we have that challenge to communicate to all 200,000. Oh, all right. Because oh, everybody okay. needs to be on the same page. But I have meetings through mediums like this, mm -hmm. where I have a broadcast town halls, you know, to all of our IT staff, wherever they're located. Yeah. And yeah. that way, everyone is getting the same message at the same time. Mm -hmm. And with technologies like what we're using right now, it even allows uh, questions to be asked. Mm -hmm. And I can respond to questions. And I probably do that maybe two to three times a year where we get everybody online. Right. And they're usually well attended. We record them for playback and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. But because it really is important to communicate and make sure that everybody has the same information. Yes. Well, and uh, I know that we've talked about uh, the three-year strategy that you, I think, you're in the midst of now. And on the tech side, it's all that, well, we mentioned moving apps to the cloud, reducing your data center footprint, the agile and the design thinking. 
all of that kind of leads into a whole lot of re-educating and retraining that is going on and needs to go on inside of any IT organization. How are you approaching that? Do you have something like a Kaiser Permanente IT University? You know, some some organizations do that where they have almost a formal educational approach to staff re skilling and retraining. So what are you doing to kind of help make this change more palatable? So this is such a big change effort. It I really know. is. It's I a know. lot of lot of aspects to it. But specifically under the Empower Our People, mm-hmm. we we've built out curriculums. Ah. Okay. And we're thinking about personas within our organization and what training should people go through depending upon the role they play? Excellent. So it's like a role-based mm-hmm. training, if you will. Yeah. And uh, and that's how we're going to get through this and make sure that people get the right training so they're equipped to deliver mm-hmm. the kind of um, things that we want them to deliver on to support the strategy. Mm-hmm. Okay. The um, I know what uh, when we've talked previously, one of the I have a lot of I have a lot of Dick Daniels quotes that I've written down, and one of them that I like uh, top of mind for you is equipping your leaders on how to lead through change, um, and another one a, 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 another one that is a favorite of mine that you say that if you're leading and no one's following, you're just another person taking a walk. I don't know if that's yeah. an original, but it's a great one. <laughs> well, well, you know, it is. It's really important because it takes a lot of leadership. Yeah. And leadership, uh, when done well, you, you can't make people follow you. No. But you, you but it's important for leaders to lead in a way that will enlist people to want to follow. Yes, exactly. And and I think having a vision, having a strategy, making sure it's clearly communicated, mm-hmm. having uh, I'm going to say a little bit of structure for how what steps you mm-hmm. want to take to get there. I think people will join you on the journey if you're providing good leadership. Yes, yes. Well, and one of the things when we've talked about this in the past, one of the points you make is the importance of learning to tell good stories. And how have you, over over the years, how have you honed your own storytelling abilities? Because you do good, you spin a good yarn, even without your pillars. Uh, Well, really, it's a skill that we really want everyone to be able to build. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kaiser Permanente uh, is a mission-driven organization. And usually uh, people, um, most people are mission-driven. If you really, you know, spend time with them. It's how people get motivated. Yeah. Right. It's, it's it's, It's very motivating. And we encourage people to tell their story. We encourage Mm -hmm. them to uh, learn to tell stories. We provide space. And it's surprising when you provide space and give people the opportunity to tell their story, you can connect with them in ways that is you couldn't otherwise. Mm -hmm. So we we try to provide a little structure for people to be able to do, do, do some storytelling. Uh, we ask people to provide time in some of their meetings mm-hmm. where they can hear each other's stories. And it's, it's surprising what you learn. Yeah. But it, it also builds a lot of, I'm going to say, uh, glue uh, with the organization mm-hmm. because not only are people contributing to the organization, but they can find a way to live out uh, their own story within the organization. So mm-hmm. it, it really sort of... Um, I'm going to say buys them to the organization in a very special yeah. way. Well, and I was thinking since we're talking about healthcare overall, I, I feel like it builds more connective tissue into the organization to do that. So. Yeah, it's true because, mm-hmm. frankly, at some point in our lives, we all, you know, connect with the healthcare system at some point. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed we do. Um, 
I wanted to talk next about the uh, kind of the evolution into the future and the innovation aspects. I know two years ago, uh, Kaiser launched these members, the member centric medical office model. I think you have 10 clinics now around this. You, you sent me that marvelous article in Fast Company with the interview with your CEO, Bernard Tyson, about what's happening with that. Um, and they sound amazing, the clinics, but I wanted to hear from you more about where that where that is in terms of rollout and what kind of a role IT is playing in it. Do you have a special team that's devoted to these special clinics? Talk a little bit about all that. So we, we did a project, with our, I, I say a project, there was a big effort mm -hmm. to do what we call reimagining ambulatory design. So our clinics reimagine them. Um, uh, many of us have been in clinics and you know how they look and we wanted to do something yeah. fresh. We wanted to do, to do something uh, that was uh, mo more modern. Mm -hmm. And the team, there was a cross-functional team put together which included IT and we actually mocked up a clinic in a warehouse oh, and man. we started to rethink what it could look like and probably one of the more innovative things we did is we brought in some of our members and patients to get their perspective mm -hmm. on, you know, what it was like and what was the experience like. And we obviously we brought in our doctors and our clinicians and we started, uh, I'm going to say, looking at a lot of different ideas. Uh, one of the things we looked externally as well. Mm -hmm. And one of the ideas um, <laughs> was from the Apple store, the Genius Bar. Yeah. So we put that up, and it provided a place where people could come and ask questions. So whether than just sit in the waiting room, mm -hmm. and actually uh, there was a lot of value that came out of that because, you know, we have our mobile app, and we can help people get, you know, it's if they schedule. don't have the mobile app, we mm -hmm. can help them set it up. And uh, so there were a number of ideas that we actually implemented. I'll give you another one that I thought was pretty interesting. And that is the when you walk in an, in an exam room, and there is the table <laughs> that's usually <laughs> the in table the with that room. paper thing on it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah uh <-huh>. exactly. <laughs> so we work with manufacturers, and you know, it looks the what we have now is it looks like a lazy boy chair. Oh wow! And you can sit in, uh -huh. and then if you need to go to a table, it flattens out like a bed. Oh, how so neat. just yeah. ideas like that. Mm -hmm. One of the other things we did in the exam room, we put a screen up in the exam room, and it's a it's a pretty large screen. Mm -hmm. But from the screen, you can video conference with the specialist if that's necessary. Yeah. So you have video conferencing capability from the room, because otherwise, you know, you see your primary care physician, and you may need to go home and get another appointment. Well, perhaps we can take care. Of you know, oh, that nice. second appointment while yeah. while you're in the office. So what IT did play a big role, yeah. and we actually implemented a, a number of different technologies to create a different experience. Mm -hmm. So as an example, one of the experiences is we allow people to check in for their appointment from home. Okay. Much like we do with the airlines oh. where we print out our boarding passes at home. Yeah. So you can print out a document at home. You can make your copay before you ever leave home. And you come into our medical office building, and there's a kiosk that just scans your QR code and lets us know that you're there. Mm -hmm. And that's the way you check in. And uh, if there, if you need to pick up a prescription, we can text you when your prescription is ready. Okay. So there are a number of technologies that we implement mm -hmm. to uh, make that a, a more you know, it's always tough when we go to the visit, go to the doctor, mm -hmm. but we wanted to make sure it was a good experience. Yeah. Well, and I could see doctors, you know, once they get used to the idea that they have to learn another tech thing, um, I could see them really liking the fact that they can sit there and be face-to-face -face with the patient instead of constantly swinging away to type things in on a terminal. I know my own primary gets very frustrated with that. She'll be like, you ask a question, she's like, well, I can check that, and, you know, and she has to turn away and type in it. And usually they're muttering under their breath about the system and how much they dislike it, <laughs> that kind of thing. Now, you have, uh, you have many, I think, hundreds of medical office buildings. Uh, so this is not everywhere yet. 
Well, okay. Uh, we have about 670 medical office buildings around the country. I thought there were a lot, and, yeah. And what we're doing, all of our new medical office buildings are being built with a new design. Okay. So we don't have a special team. This is just the way we're going to build them going forward. Okay. And in many cases, we're retrofitting some of the existing medical office buildings mm -hmm. with the new design. Yeah. Well, and I love the idea of being able to go in and, and like, the kiosk check-in. Because that's one of the first things you have to do when you go to a medical office is you have to go up to the desk and try to get the attention of one of the two or three extremely harassed looking clerks that are behind the desk and they're on the phone with other people. And, you know, it's just you have to you have to give yourself that you have to have a Zen attitude toward it or you could get very frustrated. So the idea of just adding little human touches in like that, I think, is in and of itself pretty clever. It is, and I'll tell you something I'm thinking about, yeah. and we, we haven't implemented it yet, but there's this geofencing capability ah. that, or facial recognition, yep. you know, so there is, there's still lots of opportunities for us to do even more than what we've done already. Yeah. Now, how do you keep up with all of that? I mean, you've got a lot going on with everything you're running. What, what is your approach to kind of staying current? Uh, with all of these possibilities, or do you just drop in and visit with your innovation team uh, a couple of times a month? How do you kind of stay on top of these things? So, uh, well, first of all, I have to stay in touch with the technology that's going on around us. So mm -hmm. I try to make room in my schedule for that. In terms of staying connected with our innovation teams, I don't just drop in on them. They're scheduled. I, oh, okay. I have time to actually schedule mm -hmm. where, you know, and, and frankly, I'm challenging to challenging our organization to see how and where should we be using some of these new technologies. Okay. And then my team is often doing new technologies that I'm not even aware of. So yeah. it really is important for me to stay connected with them mm -hmm. and make sure that we're implementing these new technologies in a way that's safe as well as reliable. Yeah. So I, it's part of my schedule. Okay. Well, and we were talking about all the really nice kind of human benefits of these. These I think there's ten of these new clinics that have a lot of these. You know, the full screen in the in the room and the different sort of check in, but they also are a big cost savings. I think in the Fast Company article about this, they noted that um, they're projected by ten to 20, 10, 20 to forty percent boost in the number of face-to-face -face visits that they can schedule in these rooms because of it. Uh, that's that's a pretty big operational boost. Mm. Yes, and, and actually, um, in addition to that, because uh, we re-engineered the way the space is utilized, mm -hmm. in some cases we reduced the number of square feet that's required because we just... Uh, reimagine it, if you will, yeah. and we're doing it in a, in a very different way. So the throughput is higher, the uh, amount of space is less, mm -hmm. and all of that contributes to a better experience for our members. Yeah. The um, One of the points you've also made when we've talked in the past about um, how important it is to learn the business. And I like there was one of the interviews you did, you talked about how if you're <laughs> on a bad day or a really hectic week, you'll still go out of your way to stop in at a hospital and that that sort of recharges your own batteries. Um, why, why is that? How do you approach that when you drop in on a hospital? Well, um, or well, do you arrange that with, in advance? Uh, no, uh, no, I want to, I want to speak to both points. Mm -hmm. I think one of the ways that IT professionals can become more valuable to their organizations is to really learn the business. Yep. Uh, I mean, we, we as IT professionals, it's great to know the technology, but it's more powerful when we know the technology and we know the business. Mm -hmm. So I, I, would, I would recommend to any IT leader or IT professional to really uh, invest the time to learn the business. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, uh, I was I was telling you about um, our mission is to provide high quality, affordable health care to our members and the communities that we serve. 
And sometimes uh, you're, you're right. If I have a tough day or a tough week, and I could just stop by a hospital and no, I'm not, I don't schedule it. I could just stop by and I could just walk through. Mm -hmm. And when I walk through a hospital and I see our clinicians at work, I see, you know, patients coming in for care or coming in to pick up their prescription or coming in to get their lab results. It really grounds me. And it also provides the context for the work that we do from a technology perspective, how important it is to the lives of people. Okay. And, and that is, um, you know, it, it keeps me grounded. Yeah. And it, it gives me the real purpose mm -hmm. for what we do every day. Yeah. It, it serves to refresh your mission, the mission focus, I would imagine. Right. Now, do you ask of or require uh, the people in your IT organization to do similar things, to do some of that walking a mile in the shoes? Do you send them out to the clinics? Do they go hang around with the nurses, that kind of thing? The, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, even my admins. Because it, it really is important mm -hmm. uh, that we be out in the field, that we understand, you know, the the work we do. Um, there are some people that are, are on the front line, like our desktop support people. I mean, they're out with our our employees all the time, mm -hmm. uh, servicing them. But it could be very convenient for someone who doesn't need to do that to never go. So yes, I absolutely ask and encourage. And in some cases, you know, push people to actually go out and see how are our employees utilizing the technologies that we provide. And let's look for areas where we can make it easier for them to do what they did. Okay. Well, let's talk next about the whole talent question. Uh, whenever I ask CIOs what are the three most important things on your mind, it's usually cybersecurity, business strategy, and talent acquisition or talent retention. And we talked a little bit already about retraining and that sort of thing, but especially uh, one of the things you've said in the past about how important it is to build the culture that you want and need. And I wondered what your game plan was around that. And it Building culture really has a lot to do with the talent that you can attract into into your company. So what is your approach to that, and what is the biggest issue you're trying to solve these days with talent acquisition? It, it's a very big deal, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that we have the right talent in our organization to deliver on some of these uh, challenging uh, challenging strategies that we have in front of us. And it's also challenging for me uh, being here in the Bay Area where there are so many technology companies and I'm competing with them for talent. Mm -hmm. So yes, I want to make sure I create a great environment for people to work in. Uh, we provide meaning mm -hmm. to the work like mm -hmm. we just discussed. Mm -hmm. The mission. Uh, and I need to make sure I can diversify my workforce um, geographically uh, because competing in the Bay Area for talent is very difficult. Yeah. So one of the things that we've done is uh, diversify geographically. So I have a technology campus in Portland, mm -hmm. I have another one in Colorado, and another one in Atlanta because we can find you know, you know, good, strong IT professionals in, in those markets. Mm -hmm. And this allows us to uh, diversify ourselves a bit geographically because in, in many cases, you know, we all don't need to be in the same room or in the same location. Right. We can leverage talent with some of the new tools and capabilities and technologies available to us from any place. Mm -hmm. So that's what we've done to try to help ourselves um, manage this challenge around acquiring, you know, talent. The talent you need. Well, and I'm uh, very pleased to tell you we don't usually – get questions via Twitter, because we're live on Twitter right now with this, and it is rare for us to get a question, but you got one. Uh, we have someone who has uh, sent in and wants to know, do you think that tech adds value in terms of the number of patients a doctor can see in a day? 
Absolutely, I did. Okay. And and I, I will tell you I will tell you why. Um, so more and more, uh, it, well, let me just put it this way: we mm-hmm. one of the things that we capabilities we put up. I got I guess about two years ago we started standing it up. Is this ability to video have a video conference with your doctor? Yes. So Telemedicine, than, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So rather than go in, um, you know, you can have a, a video with your doctor. Many people have smartphones today, mm-hmm. and there may be things that you can do over video that don't require you to come in. So if you think about okay. and you think about something like dermatology. Where you could turn, take your smartphone and turn the camera around and show the physician, the mm-hmm. dermatologist, what they need to see. Yeah. And then they can advise you from there. So if you think about a dermatologist, if you will, who is maybe seeing patients via video, they might be able to, to you know, just one after another. Yes. You know, just see a lot of patients. And I think the throughput could potentially uh, improve. That's true. Now, there are, some th- there are some things that it doesn't improve. You mentioned the mm-hmm. the task of entering data into the electronic medical record. So yeah. whether the person is in person or on video, still a requirement to do that. Mm-hmm. The, other, the other thing that we are, uh, I'm going to say, experimenting with is there are sometimes people would like to chat with their doctor. So they might just want to do have an online chat with their physician, mm-hmm. and you know, so that that could be a way of interacting. So I think there are different interaction models, mm-hmm. and with those different interaction models, some of those might improve some throughput. Yeah, well, and it sounds like something that could save time on both both sides. If you can just send a quick email and your doctor can say, oh, I know exactly what's going on. Go pick up this prescription. This is to be expected. You don't have to make the trek in. <laughs> well, speaking speaking of that, mm-hmm. we do have this ability to email your doctor. And in 2017, uh, there were over 25 million secure emails sent from members to doctors. 25 mm-hmm. million. That's and at that's least two things. emails per member, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's great because if I've got a sore throat or, you know, something is going mm-hmm. on, maybe I could just email my doctor. And in some cases, if the doctor can, you know, exchange email with a member, uh, call in a prescription and, you know, you can pick up the prescription on the way home. Yeah. And you, that, that becomes the means of interacting. So, uh, there are these kinds of uh, interactions, I think, mm-hmm. can make a huge difference, and it's a lot more convenient for members and patients. Right, right. Well, um, I want to circle back to something that you mentioned earlier that we were going to talk about digital, uh, as though as though a digital-type strategy is uh, a separate portion, and it may not be, of, of your overall IT and business strategy. Um, wh- what is it about digital that's worth kind of calling out separately and talking about? Well, um, first of all, this, this is a big topic. Yeah, and it is. And I, I want to share with you, we, we are so excited about uh, our journey along these lines, and I want to tell you a bit about it. But, uh, but I also think it's a, an opportunity that has – presented itself because of some of the new technologies that are available that, frankly, weren't available before. Okay. So uh, we've been on a journey uh, leveraging digital, and I just want to give you some numbers. I told you about the uh, 25, 26 million uh, emails that were sent between many uh, members Mm -hmm. and their physicians, but on our digital site, uh, we will likely this year exceed 300 million logins from people coming to our, our website or using our mobile application. Mm-hmm. And there are a few things that people are coming there for. And one of the big things is their lab test results. So members yes. of Kaiser Permanente know if you come in in the morning uh, for a lab test, by the afternoon you can look online and you can see your lab results. Yeah. So uh, last year, over 48 million uh, lab tests were reviewed online. So that mm-hmm. that's that's just tremendous. And when you look at your lab results, 
you also get a document that speaks to, you know, what's normal, what your results yeah. are. Another thing that we do online is prescription refills. So mm -hmm. if I have a prescription and uh, I want to refill my prescription, I can go online, request a refill, and we actually mail the prescriptions to your home. Okay. Well, and, and, and some we of did that, that over 25, 25 million times last year. So we mailed 25 million prescriptions to people's homes last year. Wow. Uh, so online appointing. Mm -hmm. You know, you have your primary care physician. You think about it at 11 o'clock at night. I need to make the appointment. Well, with our system, you can just go online and you can find your doctor and yeah. uh, you see what um, appointments are available. Book yourself in. So over 5 million appointments were set mm -hmm. last year. Well, and so the, yeah, I was going to say what's really encouraging about that is that bits and pieces of those capabilities are showing up in other health systems, too which is, is it, so nice. It, yeah, it's so nice for patients. Um, it, yeah. it really is. And I, and I, I still think there is opportunity mm -hmm. because, you know, I mentioned the, the video visits, right? And, you know, the email of your doctor or chatting with the doctor. Or, or I think there are still more capabilities that we can provide online. And there are many people who love the online capabilities and they yes. want to take full advantage of those. And we want to make sure that we're a healthcare organization that provides that kind of convenience for our mm -hmm. members. But, but, but your point is right. It's not just us. The mm -hmm. entire industry is changing where we're providing more capabilities to people online. Yeah. And it could just be that the entire world is the world of all the different services from healthcare through to retail and everything is really re-gearing to the millennial and the younger generations who are going to not only expect all these kind of services to be available, but will demand them and will go elsewhere if, uh, if, if companies don't provide them. You know, that's, that's yeah. exactly right. I mean, you mentioned my background in financial services. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, one of the stickiest applications financial services is online banking. Yes. I mean, yep. well, let's, let's put it this way. If you're doing online banking, once you get all that set up, you don't want to go do it again. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> so, I, I mean, there are, there, are, um, there are millions of people in this country now that have never walked into a bank branch be, because it seems like one of those pointless throwbacks to another time, doesn't it? <laughs> That's right. And, yeah. and I think the same thing is starting to happen in healthcare. That's fascinating. Now, um, before we before we wrap up, I can't believe how fast our hour has gone by. I just wanted to ask you quickly about uh, the predictive analytics area of your data, your whole data analytics um, approach, because I know that it's massive and it includes everything from your research data and an analytics center to data warehouses and virtual warehouses and all that. But the piece of your data analytics um, world over there that I think is so interesting is the way predictive analytics is starting to affect these evidence-based decisions on on patient care and things happening in medicine. So is there anything that is going on in kind of the predictive area that has particularly caught your interest lately? We have, you're right, we have a lot going on in mm -hmm. this space. And one of the things that we are are working diligently on is how do we leverage a lot of the data that we have uh, on our members and patients to improve the patient care that we provide. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a very um, significant uh, research division in, in Kaiser Permanente where we do a lot of research and med medical research and the data that we have is allowing us to do some really significant studies mm -hmm. and look at uh, what can we learn from different patient journeys. And we do we can do what we call population studies or population care, where and we can take the learnings from that and put that back into the way that we're caring for patients every day. Mm -hmm. And this way we can advise patients and enlist them, you know, in taking care of their total health in a very different way because we're much more informed 
yeah. as a result of the patient journeys that we've seen in the past. Okay. So, um, and the other thing that's happening is we've got, again, new technologies available to us like uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. where we can apply some of those technologies to the data that we have and we can begin mm -hmm. to learn faster ah. so that we can mm -hmm. continuously improve the care that we're providing to our members and patients. So I mentioned, so I'm talking in the care delivery arena right now, but some of those same, that same logic applies whether we're talking about logistics and supply chain, or whether we're talking about our health plan area where we're talking about claims mm -hmm. processing. So how can we leverage technologies in greater ways and apply those technologies across every aspect of our business? And hopefully do it in a way that we can lower cost yeah. because ultimately, you know, I mentioned at the beginning that affordability is a big objective of ours mm -hmm. and our goal is to help drive down the cost of health care. Yeah. Well, and all of that reminds me of kind of the overall theme of our entire technology industry, which has always been faster, better, cheaper. You know, where you get more efficiencies, better technologies, and everything turns around kind of faster. It, it is a pretty good description of the world, the way we're living in it. Well, before I let you go, do you have any closing thoughts, anything that I haven't asked you about or any stories you want to tell before I let you go? Mm -hmm. Uh, no, you you asked me quite a lot. <laughs> so it, so it, was, it was it was a pleasure spending time with you. I think I just want to close the. Uh, we we've, we've been on a journey from our implementation of electronic medical records to many of the digital capabilities that I talked about, and I talked about some of the volumes that we're seeing. Uh, when we just look at encounters, if you will, with you know members with encounters with us in our organization, it's really dramatic that between electronic medical record, electronic uh, email or secure email, mm -hmm. video visits, um, we have our clinical call centers where we interact with uh, many of our members uh, with the, I mentioned the video capabilities and the mm -hmm. chat. We're at a point now where if you look at it percentage-wise, over 50% of our encounters with members are, are virtual. Are, yeah, are digital and, in and, nature. Mm -hmm. and that, that, that is very dramatic. And we still think there's lots of opportunity. Mm -hmm. We, we still think there's lots of opportunities. So the new technologies, whether they're the machine learning and artificial intelligence and chatbots and those types of technologies, uh, we still think there's opportunity. And we are very committed as an organization. I mentioned the beliefs. We're very committed to continuing our journey to improve the health of our members and do that in new and different ways and also reduce the costs. So that's something that we're very committed to, and we want to leverage technology to help us achieve that. So that's that's what we're about here at All Kaiser right. Permanent. Well, I have every faith that you will continue to do that, Dick. And thank you so much for your time today and for all your candor and all the discussion about these different aspects. I, I hope I'm not going to hang up the phone here and think of a really important question I should have asked you. I feel like we hit on everything I could think of. So I appreciate your time today. All right. My pleasure, Mary Fran. Anytime. All right. Take care, Dick. All right. Take care. All right. And thank you very much for joining us for this latest episode of CIO Leadership Live. We will be back on October 15th with an interview with the CIO of Align Technology, Sri Kohli. So I hope you'll join us for that. And if you tuned in a little later to this broadcast, please feel free to check it out on at CIO Online on Twitter or by uh, within the next day or two, we will have it posted to CIO.com. And there will be audio podcasts also uh, that we put on SoundCloud and iTunes and uh, the, the third one that I can never remember. But the podcast will be out there. And we thank you very much for joining us today and listening in on my conversation with Dick Daniels, the Executive VP and CIO of Kaiser Permanente.